All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to One Life Church. We're so glad you're here, whether in the parking lot or joining us from home. It's going to be a great day. We're going to celebrate baptism. We're going to have a great message, and we're going to have some worship. So from wherever you are, let's just all sing together. I'll worship together. You can turn to 88.7 in your car. But again, we're so glad you're here. Let's worship. Saturday was sad. Surely it was true. Since when has impossible ever stopped you? Friday's disappointment, Sunday's empty too. Since when has impossible ever stopped you? This is the sound of dry bones rattling. This is the place make a dead man walk again. Open the gate, I'm coming.
small church There's nothing Oh, there's nothing was some awesome worship oh my goodness I hope you all have enjoyed worshiping outside like if you haven't stepped out of your car just try it because 
when I say the Lord is here, the Lord is here, right? Right? Awesome. So my name is Destre. I'm your weekend host. And y'all, this is Baptism Bash Weekend. Are y'all excited? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Now, I, we probably have a new pe- couple of new people here, and that's awesome. You can text newcomer to 803-598-1321 if that was too fast. It's on either side of me. We just want to say thank you for coming and help you get connected to One Life. Also, mentioning connecting to One Life, we have life groups. Even though they haven't been meeting in person, we've been meeting virtually. So it's been a really, really awesome time to stay connected, especially if you're working from home, you haven't been going out a whole lot. It's really nice to meet those people online and just feel normal or as normal as possible. So if you have not joined a life group, think it's something that you need to do, you can text life group to that same number, that 803 598-1321 and Brad and Mandy will be in contact with you about our life group options okay so definitely um, try to stay connected during these very very weird times all right so we want to thank you all for underwriting our ministry like this is an amazing setup we have here and we could not do that without you all so thank you for your faithful giving thank you if you've taken that next step and Thank you for taking that next step and actually giving during this time. Um, So you can actually give a couple of different ways. You can text to give, and that number is on the windows as well. Um, And you would just text give, and then it's very simple after that. You'll just follow the instructions, and then giving is super, super easy after that, and that's how I typically give. Uh, We also have your traditional boxes that you can come down and place a love offering or your tithes or your offerings in there. Whatever the Lord placed on your heart, we just want to thank you for that, all right? So now we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the weather. We thank you for meeting us here, Lord God. We not only want to thank you for each and every person that is here, but we thank you that you are living in each and every one of us, Father God, that you gave your son so that you can show your love for us, Father God. And we just thank you for that. Your love is unlike any other love, any other earthly love that we have ever felt. And so we thank you for that. Lord, your word tells us to delight in you, Father God. So Lord, let this service today be a delight to you, Father God. See our hearts, Lord God, transform our minds from the inside out. Lord God, we pray that you would just bless Pastor Pete with an amazing word, Father, that he will decrease so that you may increase, Lord God, that anything that is coming against you today for this service, for our baptism service, will not prevail in Jesus' name. Lord, we love you, we honor you, and we praise you, and we are excited for today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, for now, I am using this mic. Hello, everybody. Welcome to baptism. There we go. There we go. Somebody throw me the signal when my uh, my wireless is working and I will switch. I'm so thrilled you made it. I'm so thrilled you're here. Listen, what are the chances that we are actually in this parking lot right now having church, much less having a baptism service? This is so listen, we're a, we're like a we're like a startup church. We're a new church, and when a startup church like us uh, has to endure the, the the COVID virus coming, a church churches like ours who are in movie theaters have kind of just called it a day because there's nowhere to have an office to meet. There's nowhere to even film services. You're just out of luck, and you meet in a theater, which were the first things to close, and they are now going to be the very last thing to open up. But God had other plans. How many of y'all know we serve who, the one who is the God of the impossible? Do you know that? Do you know that? Those of you online, 
We never imagined what it would look like. Do you know thousands of people are seeing this around the world during the week from Sunday to Sunday? Thousands of you. Welcome. We hope you're blessed. Can I just kind of give a shout out as we start here? One of the ways that God made this possible is that out of nowhere, uh, two men said to us, listen, you got nowhere to meet? How about you meet at our place? How about we give a big, huge One Life thanks to Doug and Jeff for allowing us to meet at their plaza like this. Thank you, guys. Like, thank you, thank you, thank you. Good grief. How many of you are fans of or enjoy those reality shows, uh, American Idol or America's Got Talent or The Voice? Anybody like those? Let me hear some horns, yeah? I didn't think I would. I happen to be watching it once, and I love them. So much fun. Well, I was watching, uh, I think it was in America's Got Talent the other day, and I tend to watch them online later. I miss the actual show, but I'm watching them online the other day, and <clears throat> out comes this gentleman named Ernie. He is dressed to the nines. I mean, Ernie looks good. He is suited up and tied up, and he's smoking. I mean, he literally, I'm thinking he just had the suit made, tailor-made that day. It looks perfect. Like, he's never taken it off. It's just perfect. And he's an older guy. He's a guy probably, he's not a young kid. On those shows, you sometimes see kids. He's a guy in his late 50s. He comes out. Simon Cowell says, hello, Ernie. What are you going to do for us? He says, I'm going to sing. He says, great. He says, before you do, why don't we get to know you just a little bit? Tell us about yourself. And this 57-year-old African-American gentleman pauses. He slows way down. He takes a deep breath, and he kind of rubs his face a little bit, and then he looks up, and he says, I just got out of prison after 37 years for a crime that I didn't commit. And of course, the whole place is like, what? You what? And he goes on to explain that he was convicted of raping and stabbing a woman uh, when he was 19 years old, and he went to jail, and they put him in the bloodiest prison in the USA. And he was there for 37 years. And then when DNA possibilities and capabilities became a real thing, his case was picked up because there were no witnesses. In fact, the fingerprints at the scene of the crime found didn't match his, and he had several alibis saying he was somewhere else. But still, he was convicted in the state of Louisiana. They redid the DNA testing, and it turns out that Ernie was completely innocent. And they released him. They let him go, and he was standing there, and he had such a sweet spirit, like he was gentle and kind and respectful, and fun. And then he sang this song that was about when life is hard, what does it mean that the sun goes down on me, but it's, but it's like a fresh start is always possible. And he gets done, the crowd goes crazy, everybody, including Simon Cowell, are like, are you kidding me? You're a walking miracle. And I'm thinking to myself, while listening to him sing, 37 years. 37 years. How is it possible that this guy made it through? How is it possible he did so with a gentle heart? How is it possible that he's got a, that he's not just broken, not just eaten up with anger and revenge? He had just gotten out like within the year just seemed impossible that he'd be okay. Right now our world feels a little bit like it's impossible for it to be okay. Think about all the hard things going on. There's so much pain. Like right now you might be finding yourself in so much pain or sadness or anxiety or anger just tempted to try and alleviate it a little bit going online and writing something crazy at somebody or some group of people that you disagree with because, because we're just so broken. And quite frankly, it just seems like it's not going to be any time soon that things get all better on all these fronts, right? I mean, I don't think there's any point in pretending. And if you're like, pastor, we come here for you to make me feel good. That's not why I'm here. 
I'm here to help us all get through and to actually thrive, not just strive to make it, but to thrive and grow through this valley. And the fact is, it seems impossible that this is going to get better any time soon. Let me take you back to Ernie for a moment. So Ernie's there. He's spent 37 years in prison. Now, let me walk this through for you. Ready? Suppose you can relate. Suppose you can try and put yourself in issues. He lost, he went into prison as a teenager. He lost his 20s, his 30s, his 40s, and most of his 50s. Gone. Robbed from him. Unjustly. Falsely. Huge mistake. Huge un- injustice. Yet somehow Ernie is okay. Ernie came through, and I want to know how. Ernie, how did you get through? So I'm doing my work online because I guess this story was like last year, and I'm figuring out. And it turns out Ernie said he did three things to get through the way he is instead of wrecked. Number one, he said, I talked to God. I love it. He didn't say I prayed a lot, which you could know and not know what that means and still say. He said, I talked with God all the time. He goes, I read God's word so that I could hear what God was saying to me. And then he says, I fed my faith. I fed my faith. I fed my faith like I was starving. In other words, he says, God got me through. I don't know if you know, I mentioned it before. Do you realize that we serve the God who is the God of the impossible? Do you know this? Do you know this? Do you know this? That God gets us through differently than just making it through on our own. Matthew 19, 26 is a great verse to memorize. It says this. It says, humanly speaking, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. With God, all things. Can you hear me in Alaska? Can you hear me in Florida? Can you hear me overseas? Can you hear me in Washington State? Hello, family of mine. With God, all things are possible. Yeah, you might get through something, but with God, you get through altogether different. All right, let me ask you this way. I've got a faith test. Ready? It's a test. It's a test. How many of you, with some show of some beep horns and maybe online, say, what up? How many of you have watched The Chosen, the TV show The Chosen? How about the sunbathing section? Any of y'all? All right, now listen. If you're new to our church, go watch The Chosen. If It's great. If you've been around our church, what is wrong with you? How many times have I said, go watch this? You are locked in your stinking house. Go watch it, for heaven's sake. Go watch it. It is remarkable. Here's why it's beautiful. It's the first ever episodic look at the life of Jesus. It's not just a movie or a show. It's week after week after week unfolding the steps of Christ. It helps the Bible come to life. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. Everybody online debates as they're getting season two ready what their favorite episode was of season one. I have two favorites. First was number nine, the last one, or maybe it was eight. I can't remember. The last episode, and it was the episode of the woman at the well. And she was going from death to life. If you don't know the story, it's amazing. But don't skip ahead. Watch the whole series. It was amazing. But I've got to say, I think that's my second favorite. My actual favorite episode was the one before that, and it was of Nicodemus. Now, you remember Nicodemus. We've talked a lot about old Nick. Nick was a Sanhedrin leader in the Jewish community. He was a scholar. He was a thoroughly looked up to old man who his whole life had studied and was scholastically impressive and a teacher and a lawmaker. He was a brilliant man. I love the episode about him because here's the story of Nicodemus. We've talked a lot about him, so I won't tell you much. Here's how it works. Nicodemus was watching this young upstart rabbi named Jesus. And he was watching Jesus, and he saw miracles happen. He saw lives transformed. He saw hope in the middle of an oppressive environment. Remember, the Jews were living in an occupied area. The Romans had occupied Jerusalem, and they were under the rule of another. Hard place, but the people around Jesus, the people who Jesus touched, were dramatically changed. They were all getting through, but the people around Jesus were getting through differently. And Nicodemus wanted what he saw. By the way, if you're a Christian today, uh, let me say it another way. Today, if you're here and you're a seeker, like you're still putting all the faith things together, you wouldn't call yourself a real Christian. I, I want to apologize 
If there have been times in my life where you have watched me or you have watched another Christian and you have not sensed what I just said. It ought to be real in the life of a Christian that you see something of Jesus that you want. There ought to be a love. There ought to be a tenderness. There ought to be a kindness. There ought to be a gratitude. There ought to be a compassion that you see a selflessness that you want. It's contagious. If you're a Christian here or you're a Christian online, and that's not true of you, that if people look at your life, they don't see that. What they see is something else, maybe something hard, maybe something selfish, maybe something rigid, maybe something unforgiving, maybe somebody with no time for someone else. Then you realize that that's not the plan God has for your life, and you want to be somebody people look at and see Jesus. Nicodemus wanted what he saw in these people, so he wants a meeting with Jesus. Now, old Nick can't just meet with Jesus because Jesus is competition. You understand, all the leaders were preaching all these rules, religion, religion, church, church, rule, do's and don'ts. And Jesus was coming along and preaching forgiveness and love and community. And people wanted what he had. He was a threat. So Nicodemus couldn't be seen with Jesus, but he had to get more answers to what the heck was going on. So what he did was he sets up this midnight meeting. And Jesus and Nicodemus have this midnight rendezvous where they're going to go in a place where no one's going to see them meet by torchlight and they're going to have this meeting. And I love it because that's in the episode of The Chosen. And they gather together and they come together and Nicodemus' first words, he looks at Jesus and says, oh Jesus, you're amazing. Your miracles are amazing. The people you touch, their lives are changed. You're so amazing. We all know you're from God. That's the first minute of buttering up Jesus. And Jesus interrupts him. Remember Jesus 33, Nicodemus, long beard, long robes, decorations. He's a decorated, respected man in their world. Young Jesus interrupts him and he says these words from John chapter 3 to Nicodemus' face by torchlight at midnight. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus is a scholar theologian. He teaches the, the city what to believe and how to understand God things. And he had no idea what Jesus meant. He had no clue what the, Jesus meant by that. He was so thrown. Do you know how I know that he was really thrown? Because of his response. He looked at Jesus when he said, you must be born again. And he said to Jesus, you mean somehow as an old man, I must re-enter my mother's womb. Can, can I just take a time out for a second and tell you this? If that's ever your response to anybody about anything, you're obviously very confused, okay? That's not the answer of somebody who knows what's going on. I'll just move right along instead of explore that any further. He's obviously perplexed. He says, that's what you think I ought to do? I need to go back into my mom. What's up with that? And Jesus responds to him and says, Nicodemus, listen to me. I assure you. No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born again. First born of water, which is to be born out of your mom. And then he says, and then born of the Spirit. Jesus says, humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to a spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And in that moment, Nicodemus asks the loaded question that would change his life. He asked the loaded question that has the power to change your life and my life. Nicodemus simply looks at Jesus and says, how is this possible? To start over? To get a clean slate? To begin again? To be forgiven of the decisions and the choices and the sins in my life? How is it even possible? And at that moment, it's as if Nicodemus offers this alley-oop to Jesus so that Jesus can grab this thing and make a slam dunk. And Jesus responds to Nicodemus with a verse that you know maybe by heart. In fact, it's the most famous verse in all the world. It's the most famous verse in all of Scripture. It's at every football game, okay? Jesus responds in this conversation to that question, how is it all possible? 
And he looks at Nicodemus and he says this. Well, it's a verse you all know, John 3, 16 and then 17. He's in Jesus, you know the verse, right? For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. Whoever believes in him wouldn't perish, but have eternal life, right? That's not how the chosen depicts it. And that's not how I see it. Watch me. Come with me. Y'all with me? Everyone with me? Here's how I see that verse. Picture them in the dark torchlight. Jesus takes Nicodemus' face, this old man, in his hands. He looks him in the eye and he says, Nick, my father loved you and everybody. He loved you so much. He loves you so much that he sent me, his only boy, to die on the cross for you so that if you would put your faith in me, Nicodemus, if you'd put your trust in me, if you'd put your faith in me, then you will never ever perish. You instead will have eternal life with me in the kingdom of God. He asks the loaded question of Jesus, how is it possible to start over and be born again? And Jesus says, by believing in me with all your heart, by putting your life in my hands, I will bring you brand new life. Friends, Jesus came to accomplish the impossible, not just in Nicodemus' life, but in yours. Online, he came to do the impossible in you, in me. That is the will of our great God. He wants to do the thing you think is impossible right now. So what is it? Like, what is it right now? This is the interactive part. What seems impossible in your life today? What seems impossible that you know needs to change or needs to happen, but it just seems absolutely impossible? You see no way that it could really happen. Maybe to forgive someone for what they did to you. The unforgivable. Maybe you are thinking in your heart to renew love in my marriage. To reconnect my heart to my kids to get me through this fearful, anxious season, to beat this habit, to stop that addiction, to release this anger in my heart, to soften your heart. Hey, men, let me talk to men. When's the last time you've really empathized, like really had compassion, maybe even shed tears for somebody else's pain? When I was watching Ernie and he was telling his story, I was just coming unglued at the thought. 37 years? You go in at 19, you come out almost 60 years old, and you're going to have a soft heart? How does that happen? Only God. Only God. That's the only way that ever happens. And if God is really in the business of doing whatever it is you thought of in your own heart, what you came up with in your mind that seems impossible, what you would love, that you've almost given up on, maybe you have given up on it, because there's no human way to do it. What if I told you and convinced you right at this moment that that actually could be changed by God? Don't you at that moment, if you're going to bite off on that, don't you want to stand up with Nicodemus and respectfully look at Jesus and say, okay, you could do it. How? How in the world can you accomplish this? Really? How can you possibly soften my heart? How can you possibly reconnect me to my parents? How can you possibly take away this loneliness? I've looked for someone for years. How can you get us out of this financial ditch? Really, how is this possible? Jesus already gave us the answer. Remember? Jesus already gave us the answer. I read it to you a minute ago. He said, whoever believes in me, and I mean really believes in me, whoever puts their faith in me in a real way, not a church way, I believe... Oh, no, 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 I believe, you believe. Who wants to believe? We got to believe. Come on. I've got my faith. How about your faith? You got faith? You got faith over here in the sun section and the pickup truck section? You all got faith? We got faith? We got faith? Hey, listen, we throw faith around like nothing. Do you understand that the Greek word that Jesus uses in John 3, 16 is the Greek word pistuo? And what it means is to rely fully, to utterly depend upon, 
to fully throw yourself at the mercy and the leadership of another. Like when you go to sit down on a chair, you, you don't worry as you sit down wondering if it'll hold your weight. You tend to go into place and just plop down because you know the chair has you. I'm talking about the kind of faith where you just lean into Jesus because he's got you. The kind of faith where you trust in him like no one else, where you follow his leadership without asking questions. I'm talking about faith not as a noun, but as a verb. Real faith. Real faith dependence and reliance upon God himself. Jesus talks to you and says, if you'll live your life in a 2 Corinthians 5, 7 way, he says, if you will walk by faith and not by sight, don't let what you see on the news scare you. You can walk on faith with me because I am bigger than the headlining story. I am bigger than the virus. I am bigger than your sadness. I am bigger than your fear and your loneliness and your questions. I am bigger. And if you will believe in me, I will do a work in you that will blow your mind. You know that song that we sometimes sing called, This is a Move? Those of you with horns in your car, do you know that song, This is a Move? This is a Move. All right, that's the singing part of the service. You got it? This is a Move. Well, there's this great line, worship team, that you all know well, and it says... Miracles happen when you move. Miracles happen when God moves. But you know what the Bible actually teaches that builds on that? It says, what makes God move is when we move. In other words, somehow our faith, our reliance, and our dependence upon God causes his heart and his hand to move in our lives. If you've ever wanted to know, how can I get God's hand to move in my life? How can I get him to do the impossible? The idea is you show and activate faith in him, and somehow you actively placing your faith and your life in his hands frees God up to move in your circumstance. I just gave you a gem for your life. Because some of us are sitting back going, yeah, he hasn't done this. I asked him to do that, he hadn't done that. I asked for this, I didn't get that. A little bit like Jesus is really just Santa Claus. If you ask it, if you've been naughty, and I can't to say no, but if you've been nice, I'll... Listen, that's stupidity. That's not in the Bible. The Bible says, if you will trust in him that he knows what's best, his hand is somehow freed up to move in your life. In other words, as you cry out, oh God, take this away. This pain is killing me. This anxiety, this depression... This grief, this fear, this thought of suicide, this dependence upon approval or addiction or others' applause. When you cry out, God, do something in my marriage. Do something in my heart. God's response to you is this, based on what Jesus just said to Nick. You ready? God's response is this. I would love to. I would love to bless you. I would love to heal you. I would love to restore you, redeem you, give you a fresh start. But here's what I need. I need you to actively put your trust and your faith in me. Surrender your life to me once and for all. Trust me against what you see and I can change everything. I can do the impossible in your life. Did you all take note of that? Sitting in your room at night, folding your fingers. Oh God, please give me a girlfriend. Oh God, please make my kids better. Oh God, please give me a raise. Wow, that didn't happen. I'm mad at God. You have made up in our culture this pattern of what it means to just request of the great genie in the sky and he blesses. What he says is, trust me with all your heart and I will bless you. Give me your life and I will show you my favor and my hand will move in your very life. Somehow our faith moves the heart of God when we really exercise faith. So how do we activate God's work in our life? How do we do it? We step out in faith. We step out in reliance upon him, just like these people are about to do in baptism. 
So I want you to watch these people, and I want you to see the picture of faith in action and what it looks like. Not lip service, not religious service, not I serve and sing in the choir, therefore, no. Real faith, where it says, I'm going to get baptized to show the world that I love Jesus, and I really do follow him. Let it sink in. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, I pray right now that you would do this work in us and that you would speak to us and that you would compel us to trust you. That we would believe beyond all things that you indeed are changing our lives and you're dying and longing to work and that it is possible that the impossible can occur. How? If we trust you. How? If we follow you. How? if we will utterly depend on you. No more fake, phony, silly Sunday school faith, but real faith that says, I'm going to walk and follow hard after Jesus, even when what I see is frightening. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to lean on him. And I'm going to know that he is able to be the God of the impossible in my life. We pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Amen. a song I know it well a melody that's never failed on mountains high and valleys low my soul will rest my confidence in you alone hope has a name his name is Jesus, my Savior's cross has set the Savior free. Hope has a name, His name is Jesus, my soul rest, my confidence in victory. There is a Salvation's flame, Christ undefeated, trampled the grave. See mountain cross, lifted high. The light has come, the light has won. Behold the Christ.
listen, I'll tell you what, hope has a name. Christ indeed wants to be the hope of your life, guys. And right now, I am actually standing in a parking lot, and I am preparing to baptize people. We are a church plant. How in the world did God orchestrate this? He is the God of the impossible. And we trust him and believe in him and know that he indeed is the one who can do what no else can can be done no other way. Now here's what's interesting as I talk about baptism. Let me give another Bible quiz. The first time we ever see Jesus in the world as an adult, the very first time, who knows what he's doing? He's getting baptized. The very first time as an adult we ever see Jesus, he's being baptized, and then the second time, we see him, he begins his ministry. But first, he begins getting baptized. Guess what Jesus says the very last time we ever see Jesus on earth? He says, give your life to me and get baptized to tell the whole world. The first thing we see and the last thing we see, the bookends of Jesus' life on earth had to do with baptism. Baptism really means a lot to him. I mean, it means a lot. And that's really, really obvious and we want to be clear about what this means since it matters so much to him now let me just say this there are not many subjects in the world that involve more confusion than the subject of baptism especially where i've lived the last 30 years of my life 35 years of my life in the south baptism is really really confusing so we are going to spend two minutes explaining exactly what baptism really is so that we're not living in confusion, but in fact, we get what matters to Jesus and we make it really, really clear. Baptism has absolutely nothing to do with becoming born again. I'm using the phrase born again because we just studied that in John 3. It has nothing to do with being born again. In fact, here's the phrase you've probably heard about what baptism means. Baptism is an outward sign of an inward reality. Can I put that in language that makes sense, that's a little clearer than that? Baptism is a great first step for someone to take who has placed their reliance and their dependence upon Jesus. When somebody has chosen to say, Lord, I give you my life. I want you to be number one, most important, highly prized, the number one leadership voice, the number one comforting voice, the number one teaching voice, it's you, Lord. When somebody does that, the next step they take biblically is they go public by being baptized. It's a way to go before the whole world and say, I am a follower of Jesus, and I am publicly declaring it right now before the watching world. Have you ever heard the line that, Faith is a private thing. You ever had somebody tell you that? Patently unbiblical, false statement. Not true. Not even remotely true. Not even a little bit true. Faith is a personal thing. But it is never a private thing. It is a personal thing, but it is never a private thing. Our faith is very, very public. So when somebody gets baptized, what they're doing is... They're going public with their actual faith. And, and here's what baptism means. Here's the posture of what you're about to see in these people. Here's the posture of baptism. When somebody comes and stands in the tank, it's the picture of who they were before knowing Christ. Responsible for their own sin and guilt. Then, when they go down into the water, it's symbolic of being buried with Jesus who died for our sin. And when they come up out of the water, it's symbolic of being raised to life, being resurrected from the dead. New, forgiven, clean, pure. They now represent the purity of Christ. These people are in no way becoming Christians. Is that clear? Will you beep if that's clear to you? This is not the way you become a Christian. The only way you become a Christian, or to use Nicodemus' story, the only way you get born again is to surrender your life to Christ, acknowledge your need for the forgiveness of your sin, and follow him. Genuinely make a covenant saying, I give you my life, lead me. And then you do it. Good or bad. Now, now, now we talked about sometimes somebody's not a Christian because they're bad at being a Christian. There's no such thing as bad or good at being a Christian. 
You're not a Christian because you're really, really well behaved. You're a Christian because you really, really have Christ living on the inside because you surrendered your life to him. So what's the difference between a Christian who screws up and a non-Christian? The Christian ought to feel convicted. The Christian ought to feel sad. The Christian ought to have a sense from the God who lives inside of him that that's not who you are anymore. So when, we're un when a Christian's unforgiving, unkind, ungracious, no time for you because I'm all about me, that dishonors God and that's not who they are. So the Holy Spirit from the inside out says, come on, that's not who you are anymore. Let's wash that clean and start over. Let's try again. And, and God helps you do better. Understand these people already know Jesus. The three people we're about to baptize gave their lives to Christ in the recent past. And now they're simply going public to tell the whole world. Something really cool that you should understand. Do you see this cross? Those of you online, can you see this? There's a verse that says in uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, it says, And Jesus Christ destroyed the list containing the charges against you. He took that list and he nailed it to the cross when he died. And he washed you clean forever. Jesus paid the price for your sins on the cross. Are you hearing that? You don't need to pay that price yourself. You don't need to walk with guilt. You don't need to walk with shame. You don't need to walk with fear of dying. The reason Christians face death without fear is because Jesus nailed our sins to the cross and when we accepted him, he wiped our slate clean. The people you're about to see come up here, they're not perfect, but they are pure. They're not infallible, but you know what they are? They're born again. And in the middle of this crisis of life, the impossible is being done. They have hope. They have joy. They have trust. Even if they waver like any of the rest of us, the reality is Jesus gives them strength to go forward and get through like he got Ernie through 37 years of injustice. The reason I tell you that story about nailing it to the cross is before the, each person comes into the tank, they are going to walk over to this cross, and in their hand is a piece of paper. It's a list of all their sins. They've spent time thanking Jesus, saying, here are the sins I'm so grateful that you have washed away. You have forgiven me. You've made me clean. You've made me pure. And I'm grateful. And they're going to walk over and they're going to have a moment reminding themselves of the forgiveness that became theirs the day they surrendered their life to Christ. And you're going to hear and see them nail it to the cross. Those of you sitting here, I don't know if you want to come over here so you can see your call. But if not, you're going to be looking at some backs. They're going to come nail these sins because these sins are forever gone. They are free. So here's the kind of church we are. We're the church that cheers on people who take steps of faith. Is that true? You got some horns out there? We're going to cheer on some people. You ready for this? All right, One Life, here we go. First up, come on, Andrew. Come on, Andrew. This is Andrew McDonald. He is first. Let's go, man. This is fellow One Lifer and my friend Andrew. You've probably seen him up front with the worship team at times, uh, leading us, playing, singing with his wife Taylor. Newlyweds, by the way, congratulations. But Andrew, here you are. Did you ever, like, think about a year ago, would you ever see yourself in a parking lot? I would not have. Being baptized by a man who looks like he may want to rob your stagecoach. But there you go. Here you are. So, Andrew, your story is a really beautiful one. 
your story of God doing the impossible. Andrew and I began to have some talks many months ago. And Andrew, do you remember saying that you had question marks in your heart? Like you had questions that were like nagging questions. Have you ever had a nagging question about faith? About where you were with God? Andrew, the reason I want you to be first up here is you were the guy that was doing all the right religious stuff. Yeah, why don't you talk about that for a second? So I got saved um, at an early age. I was four years old and uh, I was at a Billy Graham crusade and I spent most of my life, I grew up in an evangelical church and past that Baptist churches and uh, I spent a lot of time just uh, kind of knowing what was the right thing to do in my head and not always feeling it in my heart and so I uh, actually met my wife um, and I just saw such a difference in her life uh, between mine and hers and mostly just in how she loved the Lord, how she interacted with people, um, how she cared for people and so I think once I kind of thought about it, I realized there truly was a difference between how I was and the people that were around me that truly had the Holy Spirit living in them. And so uh, I just knew that I wanted that. And after I got saved with Pastor Pete, I felt that difference. I, I truly felt it. And uh, I think it, it, ch it completely changed my life. I mean, overnight. How so. impossible is that? Did you just hear those words? So, so listen. This is months ago. We're sitting at a Carolina ale house for three hours talking through. So what's the difference between just believing things and putting your faith in him so that you can say, I give you my life, not just my actions, not just being morally or religiously behaved and well behaved and believe all the right things. Do you know the Bible says that Satan actually believes the truth about Jesus, but he's actually Satan and he'll never see the kingdom of God. There is a difference between belief and placing your faith. Remember the word he said to Nicodemus, pistuo, to utterly depend on, to rely upon. There are some of you that should have just heard this man's story and thought to yourself, hold on a minute, that's me. I don't feel on the inside what I see in other people. I don't feel what Nicodemus saw in Jesus and risked a midnight rendezvous meeting with just to ask about. I want it and we sat there and you were so honest. Andrew, one of my favorite things about you is you were just so blatant. I would say, so Andrew, on the inside, don't you feel this sense of real devotion and love toward God, this passion? And he would go, you know, I don't know, what's up? And I'd go, Andrew, when you look at people in need and stuff and you're like, I'd be like, don't you feel this sense of wanting to serve and be there for them? And he'd say, not like Taylor, no. And it wasn't just a comparison thing, it was a, I think something is missing. And after we talked through the gospel for hours, I just looked across the, the table, that first booth, right when you walk in, I said, Andrew, you don't have to have a question mark anymore. You can give your life to Christ and really become born again, not just churched, but born again. Somebody once said that Christians need to be born again too. Meaning just because you go to a Christian church doesn't mean you'll ever see God. I said, Andrew, do you want to do that? And you said, absolutely. And we prayed a heartfelt, unbelievably devout prayer where he's just saying, I surrender this. I surrender my reputation. I surrender my background. I surrender my spiritual resume. I give my life to Jesus. And then I'd never heard him even say, because soon after that, they got married, then the COVID hit. And you just said, overnight, I felt my heart change from the inside out. Wife not over there disagreeing and saying, no, you didn't, <laughs> right? <laughs> hey, listen. He is the God of the impossible. You ready to do this? Yes. All right, let's do this thing. It's my point. Give me some hands here. In the very first ever masked baptism, <laughs> the only coronavirus baptism service on the planet, completely safe. Andrew, it's my honor to baptize you in the name of your heavenly father who gave his only boy, in the name of Jesus, his son, who gave his only life, in the name of the Holy Spirit, who now lives and moves within you. I baptize you in Jesus' name. Come on! Come on, man. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, come on, Andrew. Beautiful. 
Oh, all right, Bob, where are you at? Everybody, let's applaud as Bob makes his way. Bob Coon. Come on, Bob. I think Andrew's story right there, you need to not let that go too fast, okay? This guy grew up in church. He's got a degree in worship. And he had to, that moment of honesty where he said, you know what? Sorry if I disappoint you, but I've got to care for my own spiritual life, my own eternity. And he said, I want to be made new. Don't let that one go fast. Leave it in your head. Because if that's you, do something about it before you leave, okay? Come on, Bob. my friend Bob. Bob, how long have we known each other? Only several months. It hasn't been like a long time, brother. Not very long. Here's why. I met him in the parking lot. He was driving by. He saw the first only ever sign that we've ever had as a church because we're inside the theater. This is our first ever road sign. Bob sees it and says, I got to check it out. And you came and you resonated right away. It was just clear, wasn't it? You found kind of your home. Found my home. So here's what's beautiful about that. Bob wasn't supposed to be here. Bob works at the plant, the nuclear power plant that never really happened. So he's like on a contract who could be gone at any moment. They came, you were supposed to be here how long? Six months. Six months, how long have you been here? Uh, we started our third year. This Three week. years, he was supposed to be here six months. As if the God of the impossible didn't orchestrate this for this man to give his life to Christ. Is that worth some horns, you think? Holy cow. So, Bob, we were in the series, This Changes Everything. Yes. And it was the week where surrendering your life to Christ, not just banking on spiritual stuff from the past, but surrendering your life fully to Christ changes everything. It is the game changer for your eternity. Truth. And you, uh, when I was done, I can't see anything but a bunch of cars. Literally, everybody could be asleep. You have no idea. <laughs> but you're not, of course, right? Four people are not. All right. So, and I said... If you gave your life to Christ after I gave a chance to receive Christ, I said, who did? And Bob, from right back there, sitting outside that, do you remember what you did? Yeah. What'd you do? Walked on up and said, I'm in. Count I'm me. In. This guy gave his life to Christ. He says, I did. I did this. And then you said, when's baptism? <laughs> it was just like, it was like you've got this philosophy as a northerner. If you're going to do it, do it 110% and do it for real, right? All the way or nothing. Why bother? All the way or nothing. Yeah, yeah, listen, listen. It's a little bit like uh, basketball. Getting close doesn't get you any points. Being spiritual, being moral, being religious, getting partway there, or Bob just said halfway there, doesn't get you into the kingdom of God. So he was telling Nicodemus, but you've got to be somebody who surrenders their life entirely. And did you do that? Yes. You belong to him now. I do indeed. So how do you feel? Honestly, how do you, tell us how you feel since that. Okay, so I, I grew up in a religious family as well. And I walked away from the church for, for quite a while. Uh, and the one day I was driving here, driving past, and I had seen the sign, and I was going to stop at a, a, a place I frequent, sandwich shop. And it was Sunday morning, I was gonna go get brunch, and I said, you know what? I think I'm just gonna go to church today. I'm gonna do something different. So I pulled in the parking lot, and like you said, I sat right over there. Fantastic sermon, fantastic band, fantastic everything. The people were great, and I just sat there and said, you know what? It's time for me to go home. It's time for me to, to step back into this and realize where I came from, where my roots are, and what's really important in life. And how do you feel inside? Like, is there a sense of feeling relieved that you made that decision? Oh, I got goosebumps all over the place uh, right now, dude. He I comes mean, up all the time after services and says, all right, I just got to tell you before I leave. All right, man, I got it. I got it. It's crazy. There's something about a man surrendering control and his leadership to another, which is beautiful to me, Bob. And Bob, here's what I want to say to you as I baptize you. Keep going. 
You belong to God now. Your sins are erased. He looks at you, and he looks at all the sins that are on that list that you just nailed there, and he sees the blood of Christ. You're an innocent man. You're a forgiven man. You're a pure man, as if you'd never sinned at all. That's what Jesus did on the cross. He died to forgive your debt, and it is forgiven. Amen. Amen. You ready Amen. to do this thing? Yes, sir, I am. Come here, man. My friend Bob is going public for Jesus. Bob, it's my honor and privilege to baptize you. As the first person to come to Christ at One Life Church at a drive-in worship service, I baptize you in the name of the Father in heaven who looks at you and says, You are my son. I baptize you in the name of the Savior who said, I have made you pure. I baptize you in the name of the Spirit who says, I will never leave you or forsake you. I baptize you in Jesus' name. Come on, man. Give it up, brother. I love you, brother. All right, where are you at, Allison? Come on, Allison Carroll, make your way. Thanks. So this is my hairdresser, Allison, <laughs> okay? This is who makes this hair look this fly. Let's be honest, all right? She's a talented lady, all right? So here's the deal, Allison. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. The backstory is simply this. I was getting my hair cut. I moved here. My wife and I moved here. I went and found somebody to cut my hair. They did a good job. They were fine. While we were cutting my hair, they explained that they were an elder at another church in the city, a good church and that they were excited that we were church planning and they wanted to cheer us on and they were saying, go for it. And I said, thank you. And by the way, I appreciate the haircut. You won't see me back here. And he said, what do you mean? I said, I really believe that I'm supposed to meet somebody who cuts my hair, who is meant to come and give their life to Christ. I want to invest in somebody and uh, somebody else, a family, somebody who can find out God loves them. I just want to tell somebody and I'm supposed to do it through getting my hair cut somewhere. And I went online and I Googled salons near me and you know, a bajillion pick popped up. I just clicked on Gore Salon where you work. Yep. And I start going through the names and the first person I go to is pregnant and they're not taking new appointments because they're on their way out. Somebody else is taking a little break and I come down and I see Allison's face and I'm praying, God, lead me to the right person. I click her name and it simply says, so would you like to make an appointment? And I'm like, uh, yes. And next thing you know, I'm sitting in a chair getting a great haircut from a talented hair, the highest, yes. I think they're called. <laughs> uh, and I invite you to church and you came. You brought your whole crew. I got to meet your awesome husband here and Stephen. I got to meet your parents, your brother. Your brother gave his life to Christ. Were you scared when you first came? Not really. I'd been to church before, but for a long time I was running from God. And I had been wanting to go back, but I didn't know where to go. And um, then you came in, and I have felt so much better. Gosh. I've been holding on to so much guilt and embarrassment for things that I'd done and choices that I'd made. And as soon as I made the choice to recommit my life, because I did it when I was little, but I didn't fully understand what Who I was does? doing. Right, right, right. But now as an adult... Knowing what it means to fully be free and loved by Jesus is so amazing. Can you, can you on the screen, can you on your, wherever you are, I don't know if you can hear her clearly or see these tears. I want you to picture this. There's somebody cutting hair at a salon in South Carolina. And they feel guilty and embarrassed and far from God because of choices they've made. And there is somebody else in South Carolina praying, God, Help me find the right hairstylist to point to you. And he connects us because he loves you. 
He connects us because he loves you. And I could be, I'm not special, but I could be a signpost to point to the one who is special. And you came. I'll never forget, I was preaching this series at the end of last year, before all this, and I was talking about how he knows where you've been. And he loves you anyway. He's always loved you, and he saw those sins before any of them came to pass. The sins on that list, they're not new to him. And I got to preach that Jesus will wash you clean, and he'll make us home in your heart if you fully understand and surrender your life to Christ. There are so many of us who, as we were little, went to church and did stuff, and somebody wanted you to pray, and you thought it was a good idea, and you kind of got it and kind of didn't, but there came the moment for everybody when you're an adult and you understand it, when you can actually surrender your life to Christ and know what you're doing. It's a little bit like when you've got a friend who you love, 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 and you look at them when they're little and you say, you're gonna be my best friend forever. And of course, you move, they move. Two years later, they cheat at baseball and you're never friends again. I mean, it's kind of, <laughs> Jesus says, if you'll surrender your life to me, I will never leave you, Allison. He'll never leave you. So I remember preaching, giving a chance, praying a prayer, like I'm about to pray in one minute and saying, Anybody in this room, if you want to respond to Jesus, he says yes in advance. And then I had you at the end. We were sitting in the theater. I had you write your name on a heart, your name and the date. I gave my life to Christ today. And the minute service was over, I said, thanks for coming. Glad you were here. God bless you. And I made a beeline for all those hearts that were turned in. And I just said, oh, please, Jesus, please, Jesus. And I'm looking through them and I go, Allison, I was pumped out of my mind. I was so proud of you. Do you understand in that moment, Allison, all your sins are erased? Like, do you understand that? Like, they're forgotten. The Bible says in the Psalms, they're thrown into the sea of forgetfulness, never to be brought up again. When you're thanking him, it's because he nailed him to the cross. They're gone. You're his girl. You're his girl. How do you feel on the inside? I'm not asking if you're perfect. How do you feel on the inside? So good. So just light and free. And I know that... I can let go of all the things that I was holding myself for. There is no one like Jesus because only Jesus can do the impossible. Following in her footsteps, her brother gave his life to Christ. Her friend and fellow hairstylist Fran gave her life to Christ. Andrew, who goes with Fran, he gave his life to Christ. It just continues and continues because Jesus is the God of the impossible. He said, Nicodemus, if you'll surrender your life to me, I'll accept it and I'll make you brand new. Not your mom's womb, but my cross. That's how it's possible. Allison, as I baptize you, here's something that I've been wanting to say to you. I see Jesus in you. I see Jesus in you all the time. I can see what he's done in your life. I wish you all could see the shot of this face I can see. You're his girl that he always wanted. You're the girl that he always wanted to make his own. He will never let you. You're in his family now. You belong to him. You belong to him. And here's what I want to ask. And here's what I want you all to pray for her as I baptize her. When Jesus was baptized, it says, when he came up out of the water, the sky cracked open. And the voice of his father was heard saying, this is my son, whom I love. And with him, I am well pleased. Another verse says, he is the delight of my life. You are the delight of my life of his life. Allison, listen for the voice saying the same thing to you, okay? All right, give me some hands. Allison, we're your church and we are cheering you on as we baptize you in the name of your heavenly father who is waiting and pursuing you all these years. In the name of his son who said, I will lay down my life for you because you matter that much. You are priceless. In the name of the spirit who is the one making you feel light and free. We baptize you and cheer you on in the name of Jesus. Yes! Come on! Oh, oh my gosh. <sighs> hey guys, before you go, I got something to tell you. In the show, The Chosen, about Nicodemus and Jesus, let me tell you what went down. Here's what I didn't tell you. They have this big talk. Nicodemus is undone. In fact, the Bible stops. After Jesus gives that answer in John 3, 16 and 17, he just stops talking. 
I love how the movie that has to fill in the blanks, the TV show, it says that it shows Nicodemus dropping to his knees. Jesus said, God loves you so much that he gave me to come find you. It says Nicodemus, it shows him dropping to his knees and humbling himself before God. And then Jesus looks at him and says this crazy thing. He says, hey, Nick, I'm leaving with the disciples here in a couple mornings. Meet me at the edge of town, and I want you to join us. You can come with me. Nicodemus is sitting there going, hold on. You want me to come with you? You want me to put my trust in you? You want me to put my faith in you, really? You want me to leave my life behind and follow you? And the TV shows, a few mornings later, they're gathering on the far side of town. Jesus and the disciples are preparing to leave on a mission. And Nicodemus is there, but he's hiding. He's standing behind a wall, glancing at the disciples. And here's what he's doing. He is in a battle. He is warring. Can I really put my faith in you? If I trust in you and follow you, Jesus, I will lose everything. He would have lost his job, his standing, his educational prowess. He'd have lost his home, his money, his family, his retirement, and his future. Nicodemus would have lost everything. But Jesus says to him, walk by faith, not by sight. Look at me, Nicodemus. I will make you new. Remember, you came to me because you wanted to be free like Allison. And as Jesus is waiting, you can tell none of the disciples know what's going on, but you do as the watcher. He, Jesus is stalling, hoping that Nicodemus just finally comes. And Jesus is slowly, the guys are like, okay, should we go? And Jesus is like, well, uh, maybe, uh, oh, okay, let's go a little bit. And he's inching toward the gate to leave the city. And he's looking. Everyone else is looking at Jesus, but Jesus is looking for Nicodemus. And he's doing this and he's looking and he's looking. And Nicodemus is standing behind a wall. And here's what Jesus can't see, but you can. Nicodemus... Nicodemus is sobbing. He is an old man dressed in, dressed in the finest robes because he is a, an esteemed leader of the whole culture. And he is bawling. I don't mean crying, man crying. I mean sobbing because he's battling. Can I leave all this to follow him? And it's like his heart really, really, really wants to, but he can't muster that kind of faith. He can't pull himself to, but he wants to. And he's battling and he keeps inching closer to going and then he stops and he is just crying. And he is sobbing because Jesus Christ just invited him to trust him and follow. And he's tugging and he's worn and he doesn't know what to do. And Jesus then says, okay, let's go. And of course, I know the Bible enough to know Nicodemus didn't go with him until much, much later. But I was sitting there sobbing just as hard as Nicodemus going, oh, Nick, go for him. Just go after him. Follow him. Go with him. Go with him. Go with Jesus. You're going to be used to change the world. It'll change everything about you. He'll do the impossible. Go with him. And he didn't go. Friends, the whole time I was preparing this message here as we close, I was screaming and begging and crying for you that you would just go. That you would hear these stories and say, enough thinking it through. Enough putting it off. Enough basing it on some weirdo spiritual resume from going to church all my life. I know that I have an emptiness in my soul that was made for Jesus. And today, I say yes. And I was begging God that you would go for him. Begging God that you would say yes and just follow. There are things he wants to do in your life right now. Right now. There's a beauty in your marriage he wants to bring. There's a freedom and a forgiveness. There is a hope and a purpose. He wants to give it to you. But first, you've got to put your faith and your life in his hands. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray with you right now. Some of you are just ready to go for it. And I want to help you do it. Just like all those you just saw and heard, you're going to have your moment right now. Would you please bow your heads with me online? Bow your heads. In this parking lot, in the cars, bow your heads. Over at the tech booth. Over here in the sunbather section, bow your heads with me, please. This is a holy moment. I want to pray with you right now. If you're ready to say enough pretending, I need some things to happen in my heart and in my home, and I don't know how they're ever going to really happen. It's so up and down and hit or miss. And we've heard today that Jesus is the God of the impossible. If you put your faith in him, he will unleash his power in you and in your life. 
My prayer is that you will see Allison and see Bob and see Andrew and say, that's me. I'm just doing it. I'm just doing it. Like my friend Kay did last night. I'm just going to give my life to Christ. No more pretending. No more banking on what I did as a kid that I know has left me confused and empty. It's time to really surrender my life to Christ. If that's you, I say, like I said to Nicodemus, don't hold back. Don't wait. This is your moment. You pray this prayer to God. Pray this prayer and God and all of heaven is listening and the angels of heaven are leaning over the edges watching because this is the most important moment of your life. You pray this and you say to him from the bottom of your heart, Dear Heavenly Father, I need you. I've put this off too long. I believe you love me. Today I've been convinced that you really want me. I ask you to forgive all my sins. Forgive me. Erase them. Nail them to your cross. Jesus, I give you my life. I surrender control to you today. I put my faith in you. I will rely upon you. I will depend upon you. Be the leader of my life. I accept you as my savior, my Lord, and my friend. Now, Holy Spirit, help me to follow you the rest of the days of my life. I pray this prayer from the bottom of my heart, and I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, here's what I want you to do. Corey, raise your hand. Brad, raise your hand. If you just prayed that prayer, if you're online, type in there, forgiven, and I'm gonna send you a letter. Please do that online. If you're in this parking lot, either beep your horn, just tap it once, or raise your hand out the window. These guys are gonna run around and hand you a Bible. They just wanna give you a gift so you never forget this day. If you just prayed, raise your hand out your window. Put your hand out right up front. Give this man a Bible and cheer him on. If you did this, raise your hand. Tap your horn. Corey, make your way around. People gave their lives to Christ and they need a Bible. And listen, as those Bibles are being handed out, the Bible says, what's your name, sir? Bob, what's your friend's name? Larry? Larry Allen. Hey, Larry Allen. I'm a Cowboys fan and he's our best lineman of all time. Larry Allen. I don't think you're that same dude, but you're awesome. And congratulations, Larry. Hey, Larry, your sins are forever erased. You belong to God now. This is your moment. This is your bold moment. I'm so proud of your courage. Guys, there are some of you who took that step of faith and you're nervous. So here's what I want to do. I want to challenge your nervousness. Here's how. I want to tell you that the Bible says the right time to do the right thing is right now. Did you hear that? Hey, Brad, hold up a second. The right time to do the right thing is right now. And the Bible says repeatedly, after somebody gives their life to Christ, they get baptized. They give their life to Christ. They get baptized. They give their life to Christ. They get baptized. Guess what? I want to open this Bible the way Bob got baptized, the way Allison got baptized. I want to invite you to be baptized right now. Some of you just gave your lives to Christ. Some of you gave your lives to Christ six months or six years ago, and since that, you've not been baptized. Or maybe you were baptized as an infant or a child, but it was before you surrendered your life to Christ. Now is the time the Bible says you go public about your decision. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm opening the tank for you. The band is gonna come and play a song, and I invite you to come get baptized. You don't have to talk in the microphone, but this is your chance to go public. If you're a visitor to our church, and you're like, my church doesn't really do baptism, guess what? We're your church today. Come get baptized. If you're like, I wish I could, but I don't have a bathing suit or what? Guess what? I wanna help you out. I brought bathing suits. I brought t-shirts. I brought towels. I brought a changing tent that if you want to change your clothes and do it right now, we will baptize you. There's water flown in from Jerusalem so that we could baptize you. This is your chance. This is your moment. Don't let it pass by. Time to go public with your decision. Come now. Come on, Will. Lead us. Come on. Come on. If you're ready, let's go. Come get baptized. I'll baptize you right now. Who needs this? Come on, Will. is greater you light our way God will run away Thankful is rising you're rising higher with power 
to take this step of faith. Are you ready? I'm so proud of Larry. I'm so proud of Stephen. Life changes when you say yes to the God of the impossible, Stephen. To the God of the impossible, Larry. Well done. Congratulations. All right, well, listen. We're going to say goodbye to you right now. We're going to bless you. Come on, Destre. Stand right here next to me. Do this thing. Our host is going to say goodbye. I'm going to stick around because this water feels really refreshing and I swim a little bit. And if you change your mind or get a bolt of courage that you want to go public, I will wait and baptize you. My God, my God. Okay. Jesus. Here you go. Honestly, I'm speechless. Like, I'm in tears. I want to be on the floor. I just... There's so much hope that has been given here today. And I just want to thank each and every person who heard the Lord speak to them and remember what that feels like because it's in the smallest of whispers that he will speak to you. It's not always loud. It won't always be such a big and great sound or boom, but he will speak to your heart and he will use people to speak to you, but he wants to be with you. He wants to hear from you. He wants to spend time with you. So I'm so full. Y'all have an amazing week. We're going to continue to worship. <laughs> and we love you, but most of all, God loves you more. Say yes to God. Come back next week. We'll see you back here at 10 o'clock. Bless you guys. I will be here to baptize if you're ready. What a day!